Okay, I've started recording. Okay, we are at 345. Are we all ready to get started? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all participants for joining us for our final panel of our conference. We are very excited to have you here, um, and we are hoping that you've had an opportunity in the last three days to learn, grow, and reflect um, during the time that you've had to participate in your sessions. Um, I'm very excited today to be your moderator. My name is Rochelle Murillo, and um, this is our panel for our final evening of our conference. Um, it is my pleasure to moderate this esteemed panel of both educators, community agency leaders, and behavioral health professionals in Washoe County. We have several important questions for our community panel that touch on the topic of supporting students living with trauma in both the school and their community. With that said, I'm excited to introduce our panel for this afternoon. First, we have Laura Peterson, principal of Desert Skies Middle School. Megan Waugh, principal Libby Booth Elementary School. Dr. Lorraine Benuno, assistant professor of the University of Nevada, Reno, director of the Dice Center, La, Quin La Clinica Viva, Thrive and Sierra Families. Natalie Sanchez, Licensed Marriage Family Therapist and Director of Health Psychology Associates, and Dr. Jennifer McClendon, Associate Professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, um, in the School of Social Work. Panel, if you are ready, we are going to dive right into our questions. Okay, our first question is for Laura. Thank you, Laura, for joining us, and we're excited to have you here and hear your perspective as a middle school principal. Thank you. Um, and for our panelists, if you need me to repeat the questions as we go forward, please let me know. But I'm going to start first with when we consider our students who are performing poorly academically, behaving poorly, and or attending poorly, how frequently is complex trauma or toxic stress a contributing factor? Thank you, Rochelle, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your time today. This is such an important uh, topic and one that's very close to my heart here at Desert Skies. Uh, Desert Skies is in just its second year of being opened as a brand new middle school in the Sun Valley community. And from the get-go, we've been able to really work to try to create a school that is truly community-based. Um, and so for me, when I think about students that are impacted academically, behaviorally, or with attendance, and the idea of complex trauma or trauma that um, means they've been exposed to multiple traumatic events, uh, long-term effects. Toxic stress means that, you know, meaning that they're experiencing strong or frequent prolonged um, exposure to trauma. I really have to believe that it applies to most of the students that I'm working with in regards to those concerns academically, behaviorally, and socially. 
when we look at the research, we know that you know upwards of two thirds of all middle schoolers are exposed to such trauma, trauma and experience. Um, but when we're working with students, particularly in these areas, and we start to meet with them and we're using restorative processes where we get to sort of dig in and try to understand the nature of the behavior or the driver of the concern, um, we typically uncover that uh, trauma is very much a part of their lives. And so for me here at Desert Skies, uh, it certainly does impact the majority, if not all of the students that we're working with in regards to um, students that are struggling with academics, behavior and attendance. Thank you, Lori, appreciate that perspective. And Megan, you work in an elementary school, Libby Booth, and so I'm interested in hearing your perspective as an elementary school principal regarding this same question. Yes, absolutely, and thank you also for having me here this afternoon. Um, Libby Booth has probably one of the highest trauma-impacted elementary um, populations in Washoe County School District, um, as well as one of the highest children in transition populations. Um, given our location and um, kind of the neighboring areas that we pull from, uh, a lot of our students are children in transition, and that is in due from um, because of trauma. So when, we, when we're looking at a student and we're trying to get to the root cause of what's happening with that student, whether it's academically, behaviorally, or in the attendance, you know, trauma is definitely one of the factors that we consider in what's happening at home with that, with that student. Um, a lot of what we see, especially at this, this age level is it could be maybe that secondary trauma that they're facing where their parent is going through the trauma. Um, we have a lot of parents who have recently had their spouse incarcerated. And so um, the other parent is now that single person trying to provide for the family, trying to get everybody to school. Um, it might be the older sibling now has to um, take on the role and get um, his or her younger siblings to school. Um, so. And, and all of that is a traumatic experience for those students in themselves as well. Um, we are looking at um, students as young as first grade being diagnosed with depression here um, at Libby Booth as well from past uh, traumatic experiences that they have gone through all the way down to infancy. So it's definitely a big factor in what we're seeing um, with that behavior and especially in that academic area as well. Um, so when we are working with them, much like what Laura said, we have to get to that root cause and start figuring out what, what is causing this and then addressing it at that, that very um, foundational level. And in nine times out of 10, we are finding that there is some sort of a traumatic experience either currently happening at home or has been happening or did happen at one point. Thank you, Megan. And Natalie, I know you have um, co-located services at Libby Booth. What is your perspective on this question as, as a community agency that are, is bringing in support and services to children that are at Libby Booth and other schools that you're at? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you guys so much for having me today. I'm so excited just as a behavioral health provider. Um, to be able to talk about trauma and to talk about trauma in this, this kind of big way is just so impactful for not only students, but I think for our community. But, you know, when I was thinking about this and I was preparing for this question in this panel, it's all the research and the data that I was looking at was stuff that was pre-COVID, right? And so just the stats pre-COVID are 45% of kids will experience an adverse childhood experience, uh, event, which is, you know, mental illness of a parent, abuse, neglect, those sorts of things. And, you know, from that number, 20% of those kids will go on to develop a major uh, mental health diagnosis. And what that really means is that they're at risk for chronic illness, chronic pain, chronic disease, those types of things. And that was pre-COVID. And now you add on this second layer of toxic stress, not only just for students and families, but also for all of us, all of you, um, everybody who is, has been impacted um, by the pandemic. And I think, you know, it gets to the core of 
how complicated this issue is. And I think sometimes because it's so complicated that people shy away from it. You know, when you think about what trauma and toxic stress actually does to your body, it can change everything from brain anatomy to gene expression. And so when you hear that, I think it becomes a little daunting. And, but I'm hoping, you know, with some of what, of what we're talking about today and some of what has been presented throughout this trauma conference, that we can come to an understanding that trauma does really underlie so much of the behaviors that we see in kids. And the more that we can offer support for that, you know, whether it's through a co-located school program or getting just the services that kids and families need into the community, I think we're gonna see a huge impact and difference. Thank you, Natalie, appreciate that answer. Um, and that is incredible what you all are doing in your schools and some of these co-located services. It's really um, great to see some of those supports that are given to some of our students that are experiencing trauma. Moving on to question two, and Dr. Benuto, this is gonna be um, asked to you first. Um, and um, my question is, how do we best support all students, including students living with complex trauma? Um, sure, absolutely. I think that uh, children and children who have um, or adolescents who have a trauma history may present with behavioral problems. They may also have or complaints with school related class tasks. They might seem unable to focus. Maybe they're not doing their homework. And oftentimes we'll see these types of things attributed to a behavioral problem, you know, that the, you know, something's going on just behaviorally with the child. And while technically we might categorize it, this as such, and it can be frustrating for everyone involved, you know, everyone wants the child to follow the rules, do the things that they're supposed to, it's important to understand uh, the context from which the child is coming from. So, for example, if a child has a trauma history, or as uh, Natalie mentioned, uh, experience an adverse uh, childhood event, they may be experiencing, um, you know, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and we might see that manifest as a behavioral problem. And if we come at it only from a behavioral standpoint, we might not see improvements in that child's behavior because we're not really uh, addressing the underlying issue. And so I think that, you know, one way to support students who are living with complex trauma is to make sure that they're routed to appropriate mental health services and a behavioral plan may be necessary if they're being very disruptive in the classroom and it's interfering with other students learning, uh, but making sure that they're getting an intervent a treatment um, that's evidence-based that we know works, that they're working with a therapist who's helping them process the trauma that they've experienced, then we're gonna naturally see some changes in the behaviors that we may have deemed uh, problematic. And I think that's really, um, uh, really important. Thank you, Dr. Benuto. And Natalie, Dr. Benuto talked about accessing some of these interventions and behavioral health support and services, but how else can educators support students? as well, just in a trauma sensitive environment or approach? I think the more that you, um, I think the more that educators can know that this is happening and I think not take some of those behaviors personally. It's really hard because you all are the folks that are you know, with these people, big and small all day long, oftentimes more than their families. And so that demand and that requirement on everyone is so great, but the more that you can know that those behaviors aren't because of something that you did or something that you didn't do, but because of something else going on um, outside of school, that you become that stable place. So all the research is really on if you can provide a stable place and to, to echo what Dr. Menudo indicated, you know, offering other services such as mental health, that really can make a huge difference. Um, some of the kids I've worked with, some of the most profound things they've said about being at their schools has been, you know, somebody took the time to sit and talk to me and that somebody asked me how my day was or remembered. I think that's one of the biggest things, too. If you can remember to ask um, what's going on in a child's home, that, that can be life changing and, you know, really, I think, forges a connection of trust. And that trust is one of the first ways that you can get back to, I think, restoring some safety and helping with some of that early trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, Dr. McClendon, Dr. Benuto and Natalie have really given us some good understanding of what we can do. What else would you add to this particular question for us to take away from? I think that's something that both of them have like touched on the outside of a little bit is 
taking a whole child approach with each student and really understanding the context in which these kids are living, where they're coming from. Um, and, uh, and that's something that we talk about a lot when we're talking about trauma-informed care for kiddos and their families. But I just also wanna mention like within that context, how important it is to support the adults who are living and working with these kids. And um, so part of supporting a child who's experiencing trauma or who has experienced trauma is supporting the child, of course. But that means that we have adults around them who are warm and welcoming and able, as Natalie was saying, to remember and able to have conversations and able to connect. And part of that is supporting parents, having good community outreach, having good fam family engagement. That's a huge component of this. When kids know that they're that the adults that they live with trust the school and trust the school personnel, then also they can feel like they're in a safe environment where things can happen differently. Um, but also I think a big part of it is supporting, you know, ourselves within the school community, supporting school staff, supporting teachers so that they feel able to able to manage and cope and provide good resources. Um, I'm a social worker, so I believe in having social workers on site so that um, social school-based social workers can provide resources both to the educators who are on site and to the kids and families so that there's, um, there's support and everyone feels safe and everyone feels competent. And I think that's a huge, a huge part of working through this successfully. Thank you, Dr. McClendon. Um, on to question three, and I'm going to I'm going to um, direct this first to Laura again. Um, and my question, and I know that Laura, as you started opening up your school, you really worked towards um, having Desert Skies be a hub in the community, just really a part of the community. And so my question is, what is the role of a school within its surrounding community? Um, yes, that was uh, part of our initial goal as a school when we got started. Um, if you're familiar with the history of Sun Valley at all, you know that it's a, a long-standing community with just tremendous pride and tradition. Um, and this community came together for so many years advocating for a middle school. And so when the, the dream finally became the reality, um, I was so fortunate enough to be able to work in a capacity to try to pull all the wants and the wishes of the community together and try to create a school that reflects what they were um, dreaming for, for this middle school. And so um, when I think about um, what the role is of a school within its surrounding community, it's, it is really about being a hub, that, that center part of the system, you know, sort of that helps to determine the heartbeat in a community. Um, for us, that is thinking about our school beyond a traditional school year, beyond a traditional school day. I think most people that work in education, we can speak to this, this uh, phenomenon that happens as soon as we get close to um, fall break, uh, an extended weekend or summer, we start to see behavior spike for our kids. We see concern and we see this manifest through students and probably misbehaving, being a little bit more rambunctious, but it's because they know that something is about to change in their routine. And so part of our goal here has been to think about our school beyond it just as a traditional school and a traditional building. Um, we've worked to establish relationships with uh, the, local community, the local community, the businesses, we're partners with Boys and Girls Club. Um, we're gonna be providing full-time Boys and Girls Club programming throughout the summer. We do this daily. Um, we are a community and schools site. So we have a full-time community and schools coordinator. Uh, we do have the, um, the Sun Valley Family Resource Center housed here in the school. Uh, through the efforts of so many people, we were able to expand the RTC bus route so that we could um, have a stop right in front of our school that not just serves our students, but it serves our families and lets them have better and easier access to our building. And so, you know, when I think about what's important for a school as a part of the community is that it's, it's accessible. It's a place that reflects what the community needs. Um, it's a safe place for everyone. It's a safe place for students. It's a safe place for staff. And it's a safe place for our, our neighbors and our families to be. Um, it's been fun being a part of this and really letting it um, be a part of the foundation of our school from day one. The community, like I said, has just been very invested and involved in this school. 
And we continue to look and seek for ways that we can expand on what we've already started in really trying to establish Desert Skies as a community school. Thank you, Laura and Megan. I know that Libby Booth is also a community hub in the neighborhood that you serve. Can you add on to this question as well from your perspective? I will try. Laura did a very thorough job of answering that. <laughs> um, you know, I would say also just really building off of that word hub. Um, we are a location of resource and again, safety. Um, but when I think of resource, I think of everything from from food because we too are also a communities and schools school. So we work with the Food Bank of Northern Nevada. We have a food pantry. Our families have access to food here um, five days a week. They can come. We we have two days where we actually, you know, have set times for providing foods, but they know that if they need food on those other three days a week, they can. Um, our children get fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner here um, if they stay for 21st century. Um, our parents can come when it's not COVID um, and learn how to speak, you know, our, our Spanish speaking parents can come and learn how to speak English with our amazing face liaison. So our, our uh, family resource center is also a place that continues education for our families. Um, we hold nights and evenings um, uh, celebrations with our families. And, and, you know, another thing that we really try to do here at Libby Booth is, is mirror our culture, uh, the culture of the community that surrounds us. Um, we work very hard to hire a staff that mirrors the culture and the diversity of Libby Booth Elementary School so that our parents and, and the stakeholders are they feel comfortable, they can come here and they know that, that this is a place of resource and support for them. Um, you know, we, we have unlimited um, amounts of, of information to provide them. And when I say unlimited, it's because if, I, if we don't have it at our fingertips, we seek it out. Um, you know, Rochelle, whether it's through your department or through going to HPA and working with Natalie to UNR to any other place, um, you know, Children's Cabinet, all of the places within Washoe County that we can seek out resource to help our families. Um, so I think, you know, our role really is that true center, that epicenter of support and, and education for, um, for everybody. From, from birth to adult, we, we will support them and, and um, work with them and partner with them. Thank you, Megan. And Dr. McClendon, um, both Laura and Megan talked a lot about providing support and services to families above and beyond education. And so when we're looking at this particular question, the role of a school within its surrounding community, what would be your perspective of what that role is of a school in its surrounding community? I mean, I think that they did such a great job of talking about the role of the school as a hub of services. A couple of things were coming to mind as they were talking. One is that, you know, I'm just aware of the pressure on schools to be all things for all people. And it is just amazing how gracefully so many school staff carry that weight. Um, but really it's about pulling in the people in the community who have those resources already and trying to create space within the schools, um, physical space, like they tried to do building desert skies, but also just kind of, you know, emotional and psychological space within the school building for, for other people in the community to be present who can provide some of those supports so that it's not all on our teachers and principals all the time. I think that's critically important. I think that gets a little bit into the next question as well. I also just want to like mention briefly, though, that um, for so many of our parents, you know, who are who are struggling, who dealt with their own trauma in their own childhoods, school isn't always considered a safe space. And so one of the things that we can do when we do co-locate these services or have spaces in the school that are just about food or that are just about finding resources for rent and utility assistance. So our family resource centers and our food pantries, is so we give parents a safe place to kind of engage and, and put a toe into the school setting where they don't feel so intimidated, like they have to immediately engage 100% with educators and teachers and the, the system, right? That, that there are these kind of 
places around the periphery of the school where they can begin to engage and uh, and begin the process of of feeling safe and feeling like they're they're a member of the school community. And so um, in that way, I think that the, the role of the school as a hub in the community is so important and the role of the ancillary services that school supports can offer is so important in terms of even that reaching that ultimate goal of getting families engaged in their child's education and educational outcomes. Thank you, Dr. McClendon and Dr. Benuto. Um, we talked a lot about the role of school, but I understand you have co-located services at many different schools. So from your perspective, how do you view the role of the school in a community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, many of the, the I agree with the previous um, speakers regarding the role. Uh, and I, I sort of, you know, I think because I've co-located services and feel just so grateful to have connected with the Washoe County School District because it's really facilitated our ability as mental health providers to meet the uh, clients where they are. And so with that, I really view this school as a platform for the surrounding community that functions to bring different resources to families. And by doing this, uh, the school can also act as a liaison between the community and then services um, services in the community. So as, as an example, I found that when the school refers clients to one of my programs, there's this automatic sense of trust by the family. It's like they've already established that rapport and that trust with the school. And we get to sort of benefit from that as the mental health provider. So they there's already some automatic trust built in. And so I, I see their role also in the capacity of a liaison uh, between um, you know, the community and the different services that exist in the community. And I'm very grateful when I get a referral from the school because I know it's gonna make, you know, this may be a little bit selfish, but it's gonna make our job that much easier to really connect with the family and, um, and they're gonna come in and feel safe and like we're all part of the same team, so. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Benuto. And Natalie, you also have co-located services. What is your perspective on this question and the role of the school in a community? I think one, just to acknowledge and echo what um, the other panelists have said before, but I think my, my probably perspective is just that of a love letter um, to the Washoe County School District. I am a product of the Washoe County School District. Um, I'm a first-generation American and going to school especially in this district, allowed me to feel included and to feel a part of something and helped my family really navigate things that I don't know that we would have navigated without the help of a school. I wouldn't have done performing arts. I wouldn't have tried different things. I, those are things that weren't accessible to my family when I was growing up. So the school environment really made that safe. School was such a positive experience for me that my mom became a kindergarten teacher and in the district and, you know, worked with, um, with kids with lots of complex trauma. And I'd got to volunteer in that classroom. And so this is really just kind of a full circle moment for me to be able to co-locate in schools. I'm so grateful. And I'm so happy to be able to give back to a community that gave me so much. And, you know, with that, just to echo what Dr. Benuto was saying too about the legitimacy piece. When you guys say something as educators, it means so much to not only kids, but also their families. And so when you say that, um, trust this agency, you know, give them a call or we'll help you give them a call and we will sit with you here and we will figure it out. It gives so much legitimacy to services and it destigmatizes mental health. You know, the whole thing that we're talking about in this conference is how do we help people with trauma? And first we have to destigmatize some of those services. And, you know, just by all of you, interacting with students every day and giving those of us an opportunity in mental health to, to help support the great work you're already doing, you do that. So good job, guys. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm gonna come back to Dr. Benuto. I didn't give you much of a break, I apologize, but I'm gonna direct this next question to you and I'm stacking questions a little bit. So let me know if I need to repeat again. So why, why co-locate services, therapeutic services in particular within a school? And for those educators that are watching today that are thinking about this is something that they want to facilitate in their school, assuming that budgetary barriers can be eliminated, what other conditions or practices need to be present within a school to effectively co-locate services? 
All right, I wish I'd written that all down so I could get every part of it. So I'll, I'll try to do my best um, to get there. I think, you know, one of the things that um, Natalie just touched on with her um, love letter to the school district, which was absolutely beautiful, uh, was the notion of stigma. And so much of my work as a uh, researcher is focused on understanding barriers to service. And these can be classified into internal barriers. And these are going to be things like stigma, mental health literacy, and then they can also be classified as external barriers. So things like cost, transportation, et cetera. And I love co-location of services because they address both type of, types of barriers. So it addresses stigma by creating a space at school where students and families can receive services. They don't have to go to a mental health facility or um, an outpatient clinic. They can instead just go somewhere they're already comfortable going. And it also has a potential to address issues related to mental health literacy. If services are on site and staff and faculty are familiar with the services, they're going to be more likely to refer and to provide the family with um, some mental health literacy. So a little bit of education. Uh, they might, you know, they might have a discussion with the family about services, why they're important, and thus target uh, mental health literacy in that way. And then, of course, external barriers are really significantly reduced. Families don't have to drive across town to access services. They don't have to schedule late evening appointments when they might be tired coming home from work, less willing to engage. And so I, I really see um, the benefits of integration related to reducing barriers for families. And I, you know, I uh, met uh, Principal Peterson, um, I think right before COVID, maybe, you know, COVID kind of has uh, muddled my timeline a little bit in my mind, but we were able to co-locate at Desert Skies and that has worked really well. You know, clients have easier access to us and um, I hope we're making significant changes in people's lives. So um, I feel like I probably only answered part of your question though. Um, you did, you did a great job. Thank you, Dr. Benuno. And that was partially my fault because I stacked up those questions. But the, the second part of the question is in thinking about how, we, how to do this with a school that has a little bit of a budget, has a little budget, how can they move to this direction of integrating services in a school? Okay, yes, and that that I, I, I like that question a lot because I think that is how I became partnered with the Washoe County School District. So on my end, we were struggling with barriers in terms of getting families to come to the middle of the UNR campus, which is terribly confusing for people who have never been there before. And um, in just having community discussions, we were able to uh, you know, essentially establish a collaboration and community partnerships can really make a big impact with little to no resources from the school as an example, all the programs that I direct are grant funded. And so our services are completely free. And by partnering with a school, we're better able to meet the needs of the community by reducing those barriers. And the only thing the school has to supply is space, which I'm so grateful that has not been an issue. On, on campus on UNR, it's very difficult to access space, but working with the school district, that has not been a problem at all. And I'm very grateful for that. And then of course, referrals. And so um, I think, you know, as long as the school is open to services, a collaborative relationship, a willingness to screen families so that families who are appropriate for the services are able to access them, it's very easy to make a partnership work. Great. Thank you, Dr. Benuto. And Natalie, can I direct the same question to you, given that you have co-located services too? Why co-locate services, those therapeutic services in particular within a school? And for schools that are working with a small budget, uh, how can they move into this direction? Similar to what Dr. Benuto was talking to us, just adding to that um, around how schools might do that. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, really, this is, I've been excited about like every question, but I think I might be the most excited about this question. Um, it's just, it's phenomenal to be able to co-locate in a school. So there's research just even, so taking a medical setting. So in a medical setting, um, let's say you're talking to your primary care doctor and he says, go ahead and, uh, you know, go see someone for mental health. They give you a card, less than 1% of people will follow through with that referral. So the fact that services are in a school, oh my goodness, it just changes the entire landscape to be able to access that care. And again, it adds to that 
um, that layer of legitimacy. The other thing it does is that one of the texts that, um, that I was actually getting is from one of the co-located therapists that I oversee, and she's figuring out a, a CPS reporting situation with one of the school counselors um, that she's been working closely with. And so you have you have a friend, you've got a buddy, you've got somebody else to, to help you do some of that really heavy lifting that you're all doing already. And I just have to say from a um, from the behavioral health standpoint, it's really it's wonderful for us too. like it is one of the most hopeful things. Like when I went into Megan's school, when I went into Libby Booth at one point during the beginning of this school year and saw what she was doing for her kids to help them through the pandemic, I just came out and I was like flying high for like a week. I was this is just great. This is exactly, um, you know, what you hope is happening out there. Um, So with the budgetary concerns, uh, to echo Dr. Benuto, that services, uh, they're at no cost to students and families who access these services. And I say students and families because oftentimes, you, as you all know, you'll get a student in and then um, you'll really discover that maybe they need some couples therapy, maybe they need some family therapy. And so we do provide that level of service and support. We also see kids during the summer, um, you know, during those off times, if a child doesn't have access, we get them access in order to, to be able to see their therapist, whether that's uh, now on Zoom versus uh, when it's been in person and hopefully going back to in person. But, um, you know, so I think the budget stuff, it's any school can really access it if you have if you have that partnership and the willingness of an administration that, um, you know, at Megan's school and at the schools that we've worked with, they've been phenomenal. Teachers have moved schedules. They have, uh, you know, made exceptions for our students to be able to seek out, seek out therapy, school counselors, safe school professionals who become tech wizards to try to find, you know, time, space and get everybody on Zoom and get them loaded. So I think it's just, it's phenomenal. And the I think the last thing I would say about the budget stuff is if you know a mental health professional, if you're friends with a mental health professional, encourage them to take Medicaid. Encourage them to take some of these insurances that um, maybe don't pay the same, but are really important and really help out the community at large because uh, there can't be enough of us helping. You know, if I had it my way, every school would have at least four of us. And, you know, that's not going to happen until more people are willing to, to do some of that work. So. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Megan, Dr. Benuto and Natalie talked about the importance of co-locating and the benefits of families. So I have a couple of follow-up questions because you do have co-located services for your students at your school. So what, are, what have been the benefits of that integration of services in your school? And then do you have any other advice around budgetary concerns that administrators might have in co-locating services and what needs to be present? What are some of the nuts and bolts of what needs to be present in your school to be able to do this? Um, so, yeah, I mean, first of all, Dr. Benuto and Natalie both, you know, spoke to it so well. Um, the benefit of, of integration is just as they said, you know, this is, this is a place and um, it's not a sterile environment where a student is or a child's going to be taken to talk to a stranger. Um, this is their this is their second home. Um, so it kind of goes back to that role in the community, right? Where, what is the role of the school in the community? And it's that hub, it's that safety net. So our students know that if we're bringing these people in to talk to them, or if those people are housed here, um, then they're a safe person. And, and so they know that that is another safe person in their life um, that they can talk to and open up to. Um, and I am 100% a firm believer in, in early intervention. And so to have um, Natalie's team working with the students at Booth at the elementary level, I feel like we are giving our students such an incredible leg up at this early, early um age because they are learning, you know, such important skills because our students have faced such, um, such trauma at, at, you know, as early as, you know, five years old. Um, so that is a benefit. The other benefit is, you know, our parents, a lot of our parents don't have transportation um, or they might not have the will 
to really, you know, get their kiddos to where they need to be. And, and I can talk until I'm blue in the face with them about the need to, to find a resource for their child, or I can provide that resource here. Um, and the easy one is to provide the resource here. And so that's what, that's what we do. So the kiddos are here and we have a quiet, safe space. Right now, as Natalie mentioned, everything is on Zoom. Last year, um, her team came in and it was a lot of play therapy and we made space for them that way. Right now it's on Zoom and, and that's been fine as well. So, so that's a massive benefit to integration. Again, it's just building that community space within this building. And it also begins to be a kind of a family event because we have had parents end up then also receiving those um, services too. Um, as far as budget, it costs us absolutely nothing. Um, our students that have Medicaid, Medicare, um, that's what they, they use um, for their services. So, you know, it, it really, the only thing it might cost me is a little bit of a, a space in our building and, and that costs nothing. Um, so there really is no budgetary constraints um, for the school to have this integrated service. Um, and I'm, I think that there might be a little wider of one that, um, you know, if you have a true community school, um, but there are grants out there. There are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of grants all centered on, on um, mental health and um, the schools uh, that people can seek out and work with our grants departments in, in getting. Um, and then finally, you know, other conditions or practices is just having a staff that understands the importance in that buy-in. You know, yes, it might take a, a student away from some instruction for 30 minutes. Um, however, we all know that we cannot instruct a student if they are constantly living in that limbic system, limbic system, if they're in that reptilian state and they're fighting or fleeing and we can't educate them anyways. So I would rather them miss out on 30 to 45 minutes of instruction one time a week to, to have time with someone who can help them um, and then that way they can better their education further than for them to constantly be living in that, that hardwired brain phase because of the trauma that they have faced, are continuing to face, um, are reliving constantly, um, et cetera. So you really, you really need to have that understanding, I think, and that buy-in. From, from your administration and, and your staff. And, and you need to understand the importance of it because there truly is an importance to have that, that co-located service at your school. Yeah, thank you, Megan. I, and you said something that kind of struck me and I'm gonna just go off of our questions just for a second because it was something that Natalie said as well. And I heard Dr. Benuto talk about this, giving a, a parent uh, referral and expecting that they're going to be able to follow through with that referral and get to that location. And you, you Megan talked about, you know, just having the will to be able to go do that. And uh, I'm, I want to direct this to either Dr. Benuto or Natalie um, in terms of when individuals are in the midst of trauma and dealing with trauma and in, in that sort of fight and flight mode, how difficult is it for them to go outside to seek services? And what is, what is that like? Because I heard you, Natalie, say that I think it was a small, very small percentage of just giving someone a referral and following, being able to follow through with that. And I know as educators, we um, wanna provide resources, but how do we support families in accessing those and, and I guess connecting it to why it's so important to have co-located services um, when there is that difficulty. I would, I would say, and I'd be curious about Dr. Benuto's answer too, um, that being able to co-locate serves, well, I think just a logistical function as well, as far as streamlining the process. Uh, if anybody on watching has tried to get into access any mental health in this community, it's rough. 
the wait lists are incredible right now. And co-locating allows for when somebody is at that place where they are willing, even just a little bit of willingness, then they can get into those services right away, as opposed to having to wait those two months. Because if you call, you know, somebody back in two months, they're done. That's, you know, that ship has sailed. And so that intervention window is really, really critical. And if something's co-located, um, then oftentimes a school counselor or the teacher, or sometimes, you know, I've had Megan reach out to families and say, hey, this is, a th this is something we're offering. You know, would you be interested? So being that external brain, which we know is so important with trauma, being that extra brain that says, hey, here's something for us to think about and for us to consider really helps folks get into those services. And I think that repetition and that reminder, because um, every time they see you again, they remembered, oh yeah, uh, Prince, Principal Wall asked me to get into that. Like maybe maybe I will, I'll sign those papers. And then we call and we set it up. So it's also taken um, off their plate a little bit. Thank you, Natalie. Dr. Benuda, did you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you have anything to add in terms of how difficult is it when folks are experiencing trauma to be able to access? Yeah, support? I think, um, you know, Natalie's description was was excellent. And I uh, loved her reference to the 1% who will accept the referral from the doctor's office and then go and make the phone call. I think, you know, oftentimes people are feeling overwhelmed, they're feeling flooded. And so they may make the phone call, but then they may get a voicemail and then they may not call a second time. And when the person calls them back to schedule, they may, you know, be working and not answer. And so it's just, it becomes a logistical nightmare. And Natalie's earlier comment sort of reminded me of the integrated care model um, of healthcare, of medical care, where essentially it's not just a co-location of services, it's a real integration, which I think is essentially what we're doing with the schools. But the idea with integrated healthcare is you go to see your primary care doctor, that is the most common place for people to express mental health concerns. And the primary care doctor says, give me a second, let me call the behavioral health care specialist. And the behavioral health care specialist actually comes right in there in the office at that moment. And they do a warm handoff. And, you know, the earlier when I was talking, I had talked about how uh, I didn't call it a warm handoff, but essentially that warm handoff from the school really facilitates trust. It reduces barriers. And so I, I, I really love Natalie's conceptualization of this because I see it as a parallel to that integrated health care model um, in I wonder if some other things that are utilized in integrated healthcare might actually function well in schools. So for example, integrated care does a lot of small touches. So people get more touches, but they're smaller. So it's not that prototypical one hour psychotherapy um, session. It might be you just come in and try and triage and provide the, cl the client with skills at that moment that they could utilize um, immediately when they walk out the door instead of even scheduling later for an intake. And so I don't know for certain, but that model could potentially be effective in the school-based setting as well. Um, but I think it's very difficult for clients. And so the co-location of services is just, um, it's brilliant. You know, it's just, it solves so many problems. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to go off script for just a minute um, and just expand a little bit more on that concept. Dr. McClendon, we've talked a lot about co-locating services and the importance of having those supports and that community hub. And so my question for you is around community schools, because this is this is an idea and an approach um, to develop schools as a community, as a community hub. And so my question is what what is community schools? Can you expand on that approach? And what opportunities might it provide for families and schools and the community as a whole? So community schools are, um, although there are lots of schools that engage with their communities, community schools with a capital C, capital S is a formal model that, that really focuses on the integration of schools into a community and vice versa to some extent. There's four pillars that are essential to the community school model. One is integrated student supports, and that's what we've been talking about. It's the co-location of services, mental health services, health services, basic needs, um, anything that a family might need might be something that gets integrated into the school experience for them. Um, and then the second pillar is expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. So a true community school is also going to have additional educational supports beyond the nine to three school day. 
Um, it could be before and after school programs. It could be intensive tutoring sessions during the day. It could be um, uh, academic enrichment, out of school time enrichment activities, but there's gonna be some sort of additional learning support, expanded learning supports during the day and, or after school. The third pillar is active family and community engagement, which we know is always a struggle, right? But this ties back to the conversation that we had about co-located services and um, mental health supports being located in the schools and getting families engaged um, and participating in school activities and in their, in their children's education. And then the fourth pillar is collaborative leadership and practices. Um, and often this is the most challenging, right? Because it involves rethinking how we how we structure and how we plan and how we lead um, and bringing people in for really meaningful leadership roles. And this isn't just families. We often think about bringing families into leadership, but also bringing in community members. What do they want to see the school providing in their community? What are they willing to do with students and for students to help prepare them for employment or for uh, post-secondary education and things like that? So it's really that, that full model. Um, and I think that so and that's the, the official community school model. There's also seven principles. It's based on lovely things like equity and um, the, you know, the foundational importance of trusting relationships and those sorts of things. Um, so it's a, I'm, I'm obviously a fan of the model, but I think one of the things that's great about it is that um, ideally it comes with somebody who can coordinate all this stuff, right? Which takes a huge burden off of our principals and off of our teachers and off of our school social workers who really are trying to navigate systems that they're not entirely familiar with. And if we can just have one person on site whose job it is to kind of coordinate and manage all of these different things and make sure that our relationships are intact with all the providers who might be coming in and out of the building and to do the the magic that Natalie was talking about with the space and the time negotiations to make sure that that people can access what they need. I think that's really one of the, the critical pieces of the model is just making sure that we have the resources for coordination. Um, and before people write this off entirely saying, you know, there's no way we could ever afford to have another person in the building whose job it is to just do that. Um, the administration in Washington DC just approved like hundreds of millions of dollars for community school models around the country. So I'm incredibly heartened by that. I'm excited for the opportunities that that might present. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the model, you know, expand and grow. Dr. McClendon, can I ask one follow-up question? Can you think of any districts or states that are currently implementing community schools that participants might be able to go research further and just see real life examples? Sure. Um, actually, there's a there's a great community schools website. And I think if you just Google community schools, it comes up pretty much immediately. And there's some great resources there. Off the top of my head, I know Baltimore has some really strong community schools. Um, Oakland has some strong community schools that have been sort of model sites. Um, and Seattle and some like Renton, Washington has a really strong community school model there. I'm sure there's some in the Midwest that I'm missing too. I've apparently just jumped from coast to coast, but those are the ones off the top of my head. Those are some cities that have, that have excellent programs. Thank you, Dr. McClendon and Laura. A lot of the work that you've been doing at Desert Skies supports this model. So um, I'd like to get your, your perspective on this question in terms of what, what, from your perspective, is a community school approach and what opportunities might it provide for your families and, school, and your community? Uh, well, you know, for me personally, it's been something that I've just sort of bumped into, I think, throughout my career, recognizing um, like that what's already been discussed is what happens in a situation when a school is working with a student that we recognize needs wraparound services traditionally or you know maybe a few years back we would make some recommendations and perhaps wraparound services would start to happen but we weren't part of that wraparound and so oftentimes you know students were maybe getting services if they were accessing the referrals that we were giving sometimes we didn't know there just seemed to be such a breach or break of conf of, of sharing information that i've just sort of grown through my experience to want this at my school and um, coming into a school that was opening up brand new it just seemed like it was the perfect canvas for it and so um, just sort of, you know, by chance, I've started to find my way um, to the community schools idea. And it's really about um, embedding 
these supports and these services and sharing in the responsibility of helping our families, our students access them. And like we've heard, they're accessing them in a, in a climate that they're comfortable with, that they trust, that they wanna, you know, when we have a school counselor talking with a student and they can walk them down a few doors and see the person that can help them directly, you know, that is a warm handoff. And um, it's not that we are um, always completely aware of what's happening when these services are being provided, but we know and we trust that they're, the students and the families are getting them. And what I'm seeing, you know, as it starts to take shape at my school, and I'm very excited to sort of still see this in the forming stages, and though we have a lot of things already happening for us here at Desert Skies, I'm really excited to see about, you know, the next iterations and what this is going to mean. Um, we have Thrive here on our campus, and you know, once you start to engage with such a remarkable program, you just want, you need more and more. You want, you know, if we could have four providers at our school, that would just be remarkable. I love the idea um, because the need is here and it's a genuine need. Um, you know, middle school really is surrounded by a lot of drama. Um, and a lot of that drama is really rooted in trauma. And we are relatively taxed, I think, when we talk about our educators, you know, what they're responsible for. Um, I don't know that we can really ask our, our teachers and our education staff to really try to reach into those areas and try to best support students. And so we do need to work with our community partners. And um, UNR has just been a remarkable partner for us in this process. And I thank everyone involved with that. But it's, it's truly about creating um, space in a community that people have fair, easy, reasonable access to. And for schools, for us, we really have to recognize the access. You know, like when we opened here, we opened, opened with some of the tightest security measures, right? I mean, goodness, it's hard to get in this building. And so when we were uh, meeting with the Family Resource Center and trying to come up with a way that you know, if someone needs to come and access the Family Resource Center, they shouldn't have to come and show ID and, and do everything that's needed to get into a school building. And so we reworked with Capital Projects some ways that we can get access to the building. And so we've got public access, but yet we still have the security that we need within our buildings. And so, you know, I think that we were hearing about maybe some budget constraints, but it's also just really thinking outside of the box. And co-locating these services, we can all do it at our buildings. And I can speak just from my own experience, um, do it. You know, try to make the space, go back and look at your goals and your priorities within your school and see how you can work with some community partners to make those goals a reality. Um, I can tell you that every week I meet with my counseling and my administrative team we pull in our, our community partners. We meet with the Family Resource Center. We meet with Boys and Girls Club um, to talk about our students, to talk about their needs, because we recognize that the, the maybe the person or the people that could best provide for that need are the people, are our partners, are the other people sitting at the table that are not just associated with our school staff. And it has alleviated, I think, a lot of pressure. It has really started... Um, to take shape in really what I think what we're talking about when we talk about community schools, and that is just a shared ownership of the success of all of our students. Thank you, Laura and Dr. McClendon. That's, um, cannot think of a better way to describe what community schools are. And we have about four minutes left. So I have one final question for panelists. And this is for any of you who are, will, are wanting to um, leave us with your final thoughts as educators. What would you need us to know? What are your final thoughts around um, how can we um, understand the importance of supporting students who have experienced trauma and the importance of co-locating services within a school setting. Are there any final thoughts that anyone has um, in the next um, couple of minutes as we conclude our panel? I would just real quickly say to, to echo Laura that do it. There's so much support within the district for you to try it that, you know, I think I speak for everyone on the panel 
that, you know, would be open to questions, would be open to try to help you figure it out. But it's it's so rewarding on just on our end. And, you know, it's such a gift to be able to do that with you guys. So thank you. You know, thanks for having me. And I'm glad I got to talk about this stuff today because it's it's awesome. Thank you, Natalie and Megan. Yeah, I think I would say uh, trauma and mental health is not uh, a socioeconomic thing. So yes, you know, booth, desert skies, et cetera, we might be kind of in certain areas when we talk about so, uh, socioeconomic title status, et cetera, but even schools that are not title would benefit, I think, from co-location services because it is not just about a, co a socioeconomic status. Um, everyone goes through trauma. Everyone could use support in, in a mental health capacity. So it's definitely something to think about. Thank you, Megan. And I just wanna make sure there was anyone else. Okay, great. Thank you panelists so much. This was incredibly important information. Um, you are all doing so, such amazing work. We so appreciate your insight, your perspective and your expertise. And thank you for concluding this amazing session um, and conference with all of your amazing perspectives as well. Um, I do wanna let the participants know that there is a Q and A chat and although we have not gotten to be able to answer your questions, we will get those answers to your questions. Um, so please feel free to put questions in the chat box and we will answer them in the near future. And with that said, I will now um, thank again, everyone for participating in this panel. We appreciate every one of you and I will turn it over to Dr. Lamarca. Thank you, Rochelle. And, and, and thank you panelists, that was an amazing talk and uh, I really appreciate you being here. I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Um, and we, we are going to, I'm gonna give you some summary comments um, and then we're gonna set you off into your teams. Um, so these are summary conference, uh, comments for the entire conference, not just the panel that we just had the good fortune of listening to. Um, I do want to start with just a huge round of silent applause for our, our uh, presenters, not only our, our panelists tonight, but uh, everyone throughout the week. I know this has been a tremendous uh, lift, and I really appreciate everything you've done for, for our students and our, our families. Uh, I also want to give a huge round of silent applause to all of you who kind of stuck with it. Uh, for the full week, um, I was I, I kept sort of neurotically checking how many people are on, and there were about 275 people for I think still. Um, that is really good. That's almost 90 percent of who was on the first day. So thank you again for hanging in there with us. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of what we've learned and, and how we might apply um, what we've learned. So again, we, we, we heard from Dr. Jennings and she talked about our trauma-sensitive classroom and our trauma-sensitive schools and compassionate teaching. We had our initial community panel that, that really talked about trauma as a community issue, not just a school issue. And, and we wanted all of our educators to know that, that we're not in this alone. Uh, this really is a, a community uh, effort. Um, we, we learned about trauma and physiology and how school climate can make the difference in a, in a child's life. We learned about the impacts of trauma on families. Uh, we, we learned in there about uh, reframing how we engage with families. We saw some cool tools that are being built by the children's cabinet in helping explain ACEs to both staff as well as families. We learned about trauma and implicit bias uh, there was a large focus uh, in that session around negativity bias. Um, that's always a pressing issue for us to lean into. A trauma-informed multi-tiered system of supports. Uh, we learned about how we need to link our uh, SEL efforts and our restorative practices and our PBIS efforts and 
all of our tier one efforts as we think about how to best support students uh, within our schools. We looked at attendance and behavior as a symptom of trauma, some of the cool things that our schools are doing to get students through the door. And, and then we need to think about how we keep them once they're, they're through that door. Uh, Betsy Sexton talked to us about mental health and behavioral correlates of trauma and she focused somewhat on, on substance abuse as a maladaptive coping strategy. Um, Misty Von Allen talked to us a little bit about suicide prevention and youth mental health first aid. Uh, I liked her focusing a bit on isolation and how sometimes kids that are in our presence are isolated. Screening and data triangulation, we have, we're data rich. Uh, we've got data that we could use to help identify our kids that are most at risk. Um, we have good processes in place that if we follow them, we can track uh, when we are trying things and seeing if we are successful or not. Uh, Ms. Hammond talked to us about student voice in the trauma sensitive classroom. Um, the, the critical importance of students feeling connected uh, they want that more than they want content, and that comes clear uh, through all of the efforts that we've seen out of that department. And then Eric Olson talked to us, and I think this was really uh, in keeping with, with our keynote around trauma and secondary trauma, and really our need uh, to take care of our adults so that they can take care of students. It's critically important. And then, of course, uh, tonight we heard from these amazing folks and a discussion of co-locating services to best support students and families. So what do we do with all this information and, and how do we put it together? Um, that's kind of up to the school teams and we hope that you really, really spend some time thinking through this. You know, when COVID hit um, and we immediately shifted to distance learning and, and, and we were grappling with how are we gonna, what, what's gonna happen? We were all kind of, very uncertain about the pandemic, not certain what we were gonna do, when we were gonna return. So as a district, we, we relied on Maslow's hierarchy. We knew that the best thing we could do is help uh, take care of basic needs. If we were able to do that, we could then challenge kids academically. And what I would say is that, that it's too bad that we re needed the pandemic to be reminded of this. Um, and maybe for some of us, we didn't need that, but really what we want to bring to you is this connection between school climate, instructional practice and academic achievement. Um, school climate is foundational. Instructional practice grows from it. It's not separate from it. Academic achievement, of course, is gonna be the outcome of good instructional practice. We put the through line in here because too often, uh, some of our efforts around school climate are marginalized or they're done second. And, and we're here to argue, and I hope this week was compelling that, and I think Megan said it, Megan Waugh and the panel said it, it, without these things, there's very little we can accomplish through instruction. So all the things we're talking about are part and parcel to a high quality instructional practice. So using this as sort of a model, our model, um, there's a number of questions that I think kind of, at least in, I was able to attend all the sessions and review all the materials. And this is just a handful of questions that came to my mind. These are not the right questions. They're certainly not the only questions, but I do, as you're walking into your school teams, I wanna give you just a few ideas that, that, that you might work with. Um, and, and these kind of correspond with the sessions uh, that we had the opportunity to experience. Does our staff understand how trauma affects physiological functioning and student behavior? Do we understand how our own emotional regulation, um, I can't see my question, <laughs> interacts with students' emotional cognitive regulation, uh, the control battles that we engage in? How might we reframe our thinking as we consider family engagement, especially with students we believe to be impacted? Do we assume a positive presupposition? Given our knowledge of toxic stress and disproportionality, do we make assumptions regarding a child's home life? Do our students feel as if they fit within our school? How would they know or how do we know? When we consider our tier one practices, do we think through um, the daily doses of, uh, of healing interactions and their relationship to student self-efficacy? 
understanding that absenteeism may be a symptom of trauma. Um, what does engagement look like beyond getting a student through the door? We often have a primary care. This, this was something that Betsy talked about, which really struck me. Uh, we often have a primary care physician and we have a dentist, but stigma swirls around having a mental health support. Does a child with a therapist feel comfortable in our building or do they feel hidden? Is a student who regularly attends school by definition included? How do we distinguish compliance from isolation? And how do we ensure student school connectedness? What information do we use to monitor and evaluate tier one, tier two, and tier three practices? Is this information given or driven by our own questions? Or does the availability of data constrict the questions we ask? Are we connected with our students and how do we know that we're connected? And do they know that we're connected? Do they feel connected? Do they know how to reach out for help? And finally, and this goes with the kind of the model for a student to respond to effective instruction and to achieve a nurturing climate must be established in which he or she feels a sense of belongingness. So we need to ask ourselves, do our educators feel a sense of belongingness? Is there a strong foundation beneath them supporting their instructional practice? All right, so we're gonna ask you to, to start your school uh, planning. Hopefully you'll take some time to do that in the next hour or so. Um, and then you'll continue to work um, in the coming weeks. And as you do that, you might consider these steps. And again, it's to begin just really with that, that connection question, does the climate of our school and classrooms support students experiencing complex trauma? Um, hopefully you all took advantage of the note takers and or you took notes in a different way. And maybe you could just drive team discussions based on those reflections regarding the content of the conference. Um, strongly recommend generating all the questions you could come up with and then narrowing them. You probably, you know, you can narrow on through operationalizing what we can measure, what we can't measure, um, maybe match those up to the questions that you ask in your school performance plans. Are they aligned? Uh, if they are, great. How can we modify our school performance plan questions for next year? How can we incorporate this critical foundation to our instructional practice? And then finally, and I, and I really hope you will think through this, what supports do you need from our office, the strategies office? I, I think it goes without saying from any central office, but a lot of what we talked about today, we can support you and, and we want to support you. So as you think through your plans and you need resources, reach out and we will work with you on that. Um, so administrators, we're kind of leaning on you to lead your teams in discussion. And I, I know some of you are kind of singletons out there and you don't have an administrator um, that's kind of leading a team effort and we'd still ask you to kind of go through the same reflective practices. Um, I think all of you received a, a email today with a link to a form that we're asking you to fill out. Um, that's really critical within the MyPGS system so that we can document your time, especially if you have an intent to earn a full credit. Uh, the link is here on this presentation, but I was unable to put it into the Q&A. So um, uh, just momentarily, uh, Anna is going to share a, a screen, and I think she's going to have a, a scan code available to you, and you'll be able to get to that form very easily. And then finally, if you have any questions, any comments, um, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself. Um, I've also included Stephanie Keating's email address as well as Delisa Cranes. You can reach out to any of us in the Office of Strategies and we'll make sure we get your answers, your questions answered. So thank you all. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the first annual conference. Uh, we intend to bring you more support in the future. Um, so again, thank you to the panelists tonight, to all of our presenters. And we are going to, Anna's going to share a screen and then you are off uh, to take a quick break and then to join your, your school teams. Thank you.
So I believe if you scan this code, you'll be able to get to the form that helps you with the credit questions. So we'll leave that up for a couple minutes. And then uh, other than that, we are going to go to break. And thank you again. Good evening.